but majority of the dinosaur films that we've explored so far have interpreted dinosaurs as caricatures, players in skits and comedies. Root Force is the exception, but its usage of dinosaurs was quite limited, relegated to cameo appearances in what was a human drama. However, with 1918's The Ghost of Slumber Mountain, dinosaurs burst onto screen as realistic and terrifying creatures. This film is a major turning point in dinosaur cinema and fantasy filmmaking in general, but the true credit for who is responsible for the images in this film is somewhat debatable. How so? Well, Herbert M. Dorley was an animator who had seen Willis O'Brien's prehistoric shorts and approached him to work together on a new project, a project that would become the Ghost of Slumber Mountain. The collaboration, however, was reportedly tumultuous. The initial premiere for the film at the Strand Theatre in New York was a great success but Dorley could not attend and in his absence Willis O'Brien distributed pamphlets claiming full credit for the film. Now in retaliation, Dorley removed O'Brien's name from the film prior to its distribution and then went on to make a sort of sequel without him, Along the Moonbeam Trail, which also features prehistoric creatures. Willis O'Brien, however, moved on to the Lost World. Now, history was not kind to Dorley. He was often thought of as a cad and a scam artist, a guy who hired O'Brien to create amazing images for Ghost of Slumber Mountain and then callously tried to steal credit for it while denying O'Brien financial recuperation. After all, O'Brien would go on to make The Lost World in King Kong. Of course, he's the real genius here. Surely. In fact, Dali's film Along the Moonbeam Trail was lost for many years and most assumed the dinosaur sequences were probably just scenes from Ghost of Slumber Mountain transposed in. But thanks to the immense amount of research from the late special effects artist and paleontologist Stephen Cherkus, as well as the restoration of Along the Moonbeam Trail, a different picture of Dali began to emerge. The effects in Along the Moonbeam Trail, made without O'Brien, are indeed quite proficient, proving that Dali's abilities as an animator were perhaps as considerable as O'Brien's, or at least they were at the time of Ghost of Slumber Mountain's production. And research by Cherkus suggests that O'Brien was not so much an innocent party in claiming full credit, and that Dali was certainly not the villain when he retaliated. All this is outlined in an article by Cherkus in issue 138 of Cinefax, and also in his book about Herbert M. Dali. I'm afraid I was unable to get hold of either of those for this video, due to both their expense and their rarity, so I largely use second-hand accounts, but I do suggest for anyone interested definitely track them down. I cannot tell you which of these men deserve more credit, but it's clear that both were immensely talented and deserve a place in film history. The Ghost of Slumber Mountain was originally presented in a 40 minute version, however this was cut down to 12 minutes or so before being extended to 18 minutes with the remaining footage believed to be lost. I will be working off the restored version available as an extra feature on the Flickr Alley release of The Lost World. This runs about 13 minutes. The film begins with Jack Holmes, played by Dawley himself. His nephews demand a story, so Jack tells them the tale about when he, his mate Joe, and his dog Soxie went for an adventure at Slumber Mountain. On the adventure, they come across the haunted cabin of a deceased hermit called Mad Dick, who Joe says he once saw staring through a strange instrument. That night while camping, Jack hears a strange voice coming from Mad Dick's cabin and investigates. Jack finds some model dinosaurs as well as the instrument Joe told him about. Upon looking at it, the ghost of Mad Dick appears, played by Willis O'Brien, and he lures Jack to the mountaintop and suggests he look through the instrument. Doing so, Jack sees back in time millions of years and witnesses a number of prehistoric beasts, including a brontosaurus, a giant bird, a pair of triceratops, and of course, the fearsome Tyrannosaurus Rex, which proceeds to chase Jack and almost eats him before Jack awakes, realising it was all a dream. Well, this film has everything. You've got a ghost, time travel, dream states, dinosaurs, and a dog. In fact, there's an argument that this is the first time travel film, adding another pin to its prodigious list of achievements. 
The framing device of it being a story told to children and in turn having a dream within that story opens the film up to this exciting sense of unreality where anything can happen. It effectively builds up a sense of discovery and tension before it actually reveals the prehistoric creatures and when those creatures appear, well, they do not disappoint. The origin of the device, the nature of Mad Dick and the manner of his death are not explored in the film as it stands. The narrative is mainly a device to justify the special effects sequences towards the end, but there's an eeriness to the way Mad Dick gets Jack to use the binoculars, almost as if he's trying to lure Jack to his doom. But you know, I guess that's just my head cannon. There's also an interesting homosexual subtext to the proceedings with this scene. It's never expounded upon, but I've read that there might have been a bit more of this in the now lost longer version. Unlike O'Brien's previous shorts, Darley and O'Brien's work on The Ghost of Slumber Mountain presents live action segments and stop motion animation edited together within the same film. This means that the dinosaurs could no longer be cartoonish creatures, but instead would have to look and feel real, so they could coexist with the live action. They are a stunning success in this regard. The Brontosaurus moves with an animal-like believability and behaviour, its massive size existing within a highly detailed and realistic environment. The prehistoric bird is incredibly authentic in its movements, the way it grooms itself, cocks its head and how it hunts. The Triceratops graze like cows, their stomachs expanding with breath, a technique seen before in O'Brien's work but adding an extra layer of realism here. And then there's the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the ultimate dinosaur in pop culture the king, the absolute bad man. This dinosaur would end up towering over cinema forever and this film is its cinematic debut. A battle with Triceratops is a classic matchup, one we'd see many times over. I've read that O'Brien and Dali may have been inspired by renowned paleo artist Charles R. Knight, but as far as I can see, the Ghost of Slumber Mountain actually predates Charles R. Knight's beloved painting of the two facing off, although the rest of the film was of course doubtlessly inspired by his other works. I love this T-Rex design. Alternately lippy and toothy, in a classic tripod pose that would eventually prove to be paleontologically inaccurate, this would be how T-Rex would be visualised for many years. Small details add to the character, like the licking of lips after the Tyrannosaurus feasts on its kill, the thoughtful caution it uses when facing its horned foe. These details bring the characters to life in a way that feels both magical and real. The Ghost of Slumber Mountain proved that dinosaurs could truly be brought to life again, and it kind of blew the doors open for stop motion dinosaurs to run wild. Footage from this film, along with Along the Moonbeam Trail, would be used in the 1922 documentary Monsters of the Past. Footage from Ghost would also be used in the 1923 documentary Evolution. Another documentary, however, called Monsters of the Past, not to be confused with the other Monsters of the Past, would actually utilise its own stop motion creations. The opening of the film would dramatise animator and sculptor Virginia May creating a Tyrannosaurus before bringing it to life and showing it in battle against, you guessed it, a Triceratops. These films I'm afraid won't get their own video as their documentaries and not fictional works. Buster Keaton's Free Ages from 1921 won't get a video either. It does have a stop motion dinosaur but its role in the film is ever so brief. The rest of the film is a sort of parody of D.W. Griffith's Intolerance. It's not one of Buster Keaton's best works. Uh, check out Sherlock Jr. or something instead. No, next time we're going to look at Herbert M. Darley's sequel, Along the Moonbeam Trail. We've discussed it a bit already in this video, but it's fascinatingly weird, interesting and, well, just kind of delightful. So look after yourselves and see you then.